conversation today with uh, a younger CEO from Roberson Wait. So uh, James Wait is going to talk a little bit about what his experience has been in growing his company. So welcome, James. Welcome. Cool. Thank you, Will. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's really exciting to talk to somebody at your age having the kind of success that you're having uh, and your team as well. So tell Absolutely. us a little bit about Roberson Wait. What do you do? And and tell us about how you do it. Yeah, so uh, Roberson Wade Electric is an industrial electrical construction company. Uh, we build substations for utility companies and um, other various markets. I mean, there's some expanding renewable energies that we've been uh, exploring lately and finding some success, which is huge in California right now. Uh, we've been, my family's been around for 40 years in the industry, is actually ex Southern California Edison employees and just kept it going. And Let's see, uh, in the beginning, when I took over, we had about 13 employees on the books. As of last week, we were around 114. So we've grown by about 100 employees. And, oh man, we've got jobs all over Southern California right now. <clears throat> so we're, we're spread out. So, well, what, what about this uh, new infrastructure bill and, and how that might affect uh, uh, renewable energies. Is that something you're going to be able to be involved with? Well, the reality is for us is that substations are involved as part of the grid. And so anything that is renewable energy or any form of generation requires a substation. And for us, uh, kind of doesn't matter to me how it's generated. It's a, what matters to me is that we get the call to build the substation. And mm -hmm. so I know that California and even the local utilities in California have a guaranteed spend for renewables and battery storage and, and those markets. And yeah, so we've, we're hoping to, we're hoping to capitalize on it. I know we're kind of on the ground floor right now. We just completed our first substation for a battery storage unit up in uh, Ventura and it, it went well. And we're about to start our next one up in uh, Palmdale. Excellent. Well, now, now you've been involved with EOS the company's been involved with EOS for about three and a half years now. What was it like? What was the company like before you started EOS? Oh, man. We reacted a lot. You know, when something came to our attention, we reacted and there, there wasn't a lot of forethought. Um, we did fairly well because we were pretty competent as a whole, but we were only at that. Let's see when we, first met you, Will, we probably had about 30, 30 to 40 employees at that point. And to us, that was our dream. Uh, when, when we, before we met Will, we, we were, I was talking with my business partner, Tony, and we said, man, we'd love to be about 40 people in our company. We, we're not even sure we can do that. And so we, we started to expand and there's a lot of growing pains involved when you expand and you don't have a clear, concise plan and you don't have roles and responsibilities clarified. You don't have clear agreements on who's doing what. And so we, we, did, we did well, but we were definitely in a bit of disarray. And uh, even, even our communication and just the structure and how we made decisions was very difficult. Um, I've been, I was told by a really smart man that if two people are responsible for something, then nobody is. And we had many people responsible for many things, which, uh, led to me calling a business a slow moving train. <laughs> it, did you find that uh, you had people who weren't performing in the organization? Oh yeah. Um, one of the concepts of EOS that has been in massively critical to our success, success is right people, right seat or RPRS. Uh, you know, having the core values under, having our employees understand the core values and what it means to work here and what we think is important, uh, growing together. We had, let's just say this, I took over, the, took over one of the departments in 2018, I believe. We had 20 people in that department. And in the first two weeks, I fired nine of them. And not bad guys. Um, I really liked all those guys. It's just not the right fit. Uh, just not a, not a heavy focus on safety. I mean, our core values are safety, quality, efficiency, teamwork, and integrity. Uh, we just, some guys didn't care about safety. Some people lacked the quality. Some people were just 
not very supportive as teammates, not communicating, um, causing drama, which I know a lot of companies experience drama. And I will say this, we, we have less drama at 114 employees using the EOS model than we did when we had 13 employees. Well, did, did you, did, did, did you, um, were you struggling with profit at any place along the way? One of the issues that we faced when it comes to, to profit is we didn't have a very good system in place for how, you know, how we bid projects and how we chose where, you know, what projects to bid. And I think in the field, because we were so small, we tended to focus on highly competent people. So we did, we did well on that in that sense, but where we would struggle with profit is not having a clear vision on what we wanted to do, not having a clear, clear understanding of say like the bullpen, who's next up, who's going to come and help us expand. And if you get overextended, how are you going to pull that off? And so we, we had uh, issues with say a profit leak for change orders in the company. And for us, yes, we, sh it's a bit of a double-edged sword because we kind of took the scraps in a lot of ways where other companies that were had, had their organization um, more tightly run, they would get more projects than us. And then when they were full, we'd end up getting the, the spillover. So it's hard. It's really hard to say, in my opinion, if, if we ran the company, or if we took jobs at the margins we do now, we would have had a profit issue, but uh, we were taking only jobs that we knew we could be successful in the way we ran. And, that's not the case any longer. It, did you ever, did you ever get the sense that the the business was owning you, that you were working way too hard personally? Yes. Um, I was one of the number one bachelors back then. I just, my focus was on um, exercising, writing music and running a business. And so I, um, I probably at that time was working anywhere from, 60 to 70 hours because I would go out in the field and work I, I wanted to understand what we did in the field uh, from a trade standpoint mm -hmm. and then I'd come back into the office and do the office work as well so I was running the office I was out on jobs there was times where I was running jobs and um, one of my friends that I wrote music with he was a uh, I remember I had bought this really nice car. I finally bought, I bought my first car. I was having, having some success and I bought this car and my buddy that I wrote music with said, our friends were like, man, James is so lucky. And he's like, oh, you have no idea what James does. He's up at 4.30 every morning. And then I'm there when he gets home from work at about five. And then we write music till seven and then he passes out at 7.30 in the armchair. <laughs> that was my life for probably five years. Wow. Well, was was your your company hitting a ceiling in terms of growth? Absolutely. Uh, we could talk in terms of revenue. We we were capped out around four to five million dollars. We sat at that revenue point. I think we were at that revenue point when we met you. And um, I think the reality for us is we didn't know how to break through and, and grow properly. Uh, we didn't know how to mitigate risk as we grew. And that was one of the big things is like right now we have 114 employees. We can be at 200 employees in six months if we wanted to be, but would that be very smart? Not according to our plan and knowing what we know and understanding our marketplace, it's not the smartest decision to do that. And so for us, we kind of would look at it and say, okay, we think we can grow. Let's uh, bring some people in. And it didn't always work for us. And so I think we, we capped out around four, just shy of 5 million. And then I think our next, the year after that, that was a uh, 2015 and then 2016, we were able to get up to just over 6 million. So we, we tried to grow, we, we pushed on it and said, what, what can we do? And we expanded to, oh man, at that time we were probably sitting in the mid twenties in terms of employees. So we doubled the workforce, but we had, so much drama. I mean, I'm, I'm talking just so many people rowing whatever way they wanted to row. And it was just, just a constant, just working on the relationships between people, trying to get people to stay focused on the ta on their tasks at hand. And so from there, 2017 was about the same. And then 2018, which I believe is when we met up, um, it might've been around, around the time we met up with you, 
we got some really cool opportunities. We ended up building the substation for the, the, the Rams and Chargers NFL Stadium. And it was our first real big break. And it was really cool because we had developed this structure with you. And we had, or with, you know, with you and using the EOS tools. And we did really good. It was really, it was really awesome. We were able to bring people in. It didn't hurt as much. We, we made some really good decisions at the time. And so we had our first real breakthrough year where we, I'd say we shattered the ceiling and the, the vision that me and my partner had where we said, look, we're going to be, we want to have 40 employees. It's like all of a sudden we're past that. And mm -hmm. we're realizing it wasn't hard to do. We, once we had the tools in place, we said, look, we can, we can be a hundred employees one day. Maybe that would be cool. And here we are now past the hundred employee mark, still with the same mindset. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. we could be 200 employees and I don't think that it would be all that much harder than what we're doing now with the right people in the right places. Well, back there before EOS, did you try things? Did you have things that you tried to, to make sense out of it? Oh, you know, one of the things that we tried to do is we tried to make pieces fit that weren't the right fit. We tried over and over. Um, I think we were notorious for giving a lot of chances. And, I, and I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not opposed to giving people chances. I think everybody deserves a chance. Uh, I think for us, we would have people that were clearly not right people, right seat, and we'd keep them for five more years. Mm. And we'd let them have 50 more chances. And we'd say, look, we can help these people. We can help them. We can fix them. We can help them fix their problems and get them on the right track. And it became a trap for us. And we spent more time trying to fix people and fix the issues than focusing on the work. And, mm. and honestly, that was probably one of the biggest things that I learned starting to work with you in EOS is that uh, we, we're not here to fix things. I mean, we, that's not our, it's not our goal. Mm-hmm. Was there any other, any other quick fixes that you tried? You know, we took a couple stabs at some new, uh, new vent, new ventures where we said, let's, let's try something a little out of our, our marketplace. They all failed. It was just, uh, it, it wasn't a tough lesson to learn, but being very focused on your target market is something that I, I got out of EOS too. And it, it was something that I learned a lot from the failure. So I'm not, a, it wasn't, and it wasn't overly expensive. And for me, I think we thought that growing meant let's go do, you know, commercial electrical too. Let's go get into solar. Let's get into these new things. And it started to get a little bit too complex and we weren't finding that the company was aligned across the board. In fact, it made us more um, disconnected. All right. All right. So, so, um, it sounded like a lot of frustration, a lot of hitting the ceiling, a yeah, lot of yeah. a lot of hard work by you and I am assuming your partner and other people in the leadership team. A lot of yeah. a lot of work. Absolutely. You know, while we're on that, we should talk about Jack, which yeah, was go uh, ahead. Um, when Will first came in, Will gives a 90 minute pitch. So he'll come in to your office or wherever you want. Uh, I guess we're zooming these days, but uh He'll give you a 90 minute pitch and he'll tell you what he does and he'll, he'll show you the tools and answer your questions. And I had known about this pitch for a year before I actually called you, which was a really bad decision on my part, but um, it took about that much time to get my, my part. I, I keep talking about Tony. I have another partner, Anthony. So it's, it's me, Anthony and Tony. And so I was trying to get everybody to see the value in this. And it, it's just, you're coming from old school. You're coming from people. So I told you that I told you we should do that. And it's like, I know, but how are we going to do it? And so finally I got the go ahead, go ahead, meet with them. Uh, we're not going to be there though. Okay. So, so I meet with Will and uh, at the time my sister was working in the office. So me and my sister met with Will and we got the 90 minute pitch and Will was talking about, having a, a clear accountability chart, people that do this and, you know, this person's responsible for this, this person's responsible for, for this. There's a, there's a whole model for how decisions are made and it's, it's a team-based model. So if you have your leadership team and you say you're, let's say you've got three people on your leadership team and they all agree. And then you say, cool, let's go for it. If it doesn't work, let's talk about the issues. Let's IDS it. Let's move on. The way we were doing it 
is we found out we had a lot of bottlenecks in our decision making because it was all about Jack. And I told Will, no, we have Jack decides everything. Jack decides what the leadership team does. Jack decides what the field people are doing. And Jack stands for James, Anthony, Tony. It was just kind of a funny little thing that we'd come up with. But uh, so we had this decision making tree that required three people's buy off. And if any of us disagreed, basically nothing happened. And so Will told me, he said, look, I'm, I'm happy to work with you. I'd love to work with you. But if you want to keep the JAT model, then I'm not the guy for you. So I had to, that's how the meeting ended. And I, I went home and I thought about it and I talked to my partners and I, I said, uh, hey, uh, I want to try this. What do you guys want to do? And so we, we, I think we had the book, What the Heck is EOS? And looked at it and they said, okay, let's try it. And so we get to the first meeting, <laughs> the first offsite, and we're still all jatted up. You know, we're, we're still sitting there going, this is how we're going to do things. And I, I think the first meeting we spent a lot of time talking about Jack, uh, going to the whiteboard, drawing pictures of what it would look like and how, how the model works. And so one of the big things, actually, this is probably the number one thing that really changed our company is moving beyond that model and teaching people to be leaders and peeping, teaching people to be self-sufficient and understand their job and having the right people in the right places that can make decisions. And if they can't, they seek help. They come to you for your support. And it's not them going, I don't know what to do because James hasn't told me to do it yet. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so now let's skip forward three, four years and okay. here you are today. What is the difference that you've been uh, learning, uh, implementing, and sharing, and then teaching your, your whole team, your whole organization to use EOS? What, how would you describe it today? The biggest change for me is that people really enjoy working here. Um, I don't, I couldn't say that with a straight face three or four years ago. I think there's a lot of people that were, they were just here to be here. And I've had a lot of, uh, how do I say this? I've been out in the field. I got a lot of feedback and the overall consensus is this is one of the best places people have ever worked. And I mean, I'm talking like guys that have come out of the construction field where it's a, it's a pretty rough neck arena. I mean, it's, I was telling my assistant, I was like, I got to make sure I keep the cursing to a minimum on this show today. But you get in that arena and it's, it's, it's pretty tough. And I've just got a lot, I've seen a lot of guys like just open up and say, look, I want something meaningful. I, I want that. And I like what's happening here. And I'm, I'm in, I, I want to, I want to be a part of this vision. And so for me, you fast forward four years and you're seeing almost a hundred percent of the people bought into the vision. And it's not a forceful thing. Um, the, there's the, it came up recently. Someone uh, called us a cult. <laughs> I thought it was funny because I said, look, maybe. But the reality is I've never met a cult that pays people to be part of it. I figured they'd be sending me checks if that were the case. So I, uh, so I, I think when you, when you create your VTO, you've got a clear, concise vision. You've got right people, right seats. You've got a really solid accountability chart. That's where we're sitting four years later. Is we've got all of our core processes broken out. Everybody knows what they need to do. And yes, I'm not saying things are perfect, but we have a target. And I think that that's one of the big changes is we know where we're heading. We can see it out on the horizon. And, and for us, it's a, uh, we never had that before. We didn't have a real trajectory. We had a kind of a general idea of what that could be. And now we've got a, we've got a target. We're moving towards it. If it doesn't work, we modify it, we adapt, we adjust. And I'm starting to see that now moving down through the ranks. Um, our, our niche, our saying is solving powerful problems. You're starting to see that come to life across the board. And you're starting to see people think like, hey, we could be that too. You know, it's not just the upper management. People are, are just, they truly wanna be a part of that and they love that. And, and they should be because they're very competent, qualified individuals. I think across the board, I haven't met a lot of the new people. I'd say we've probably got about 20 to 30 employees that have come on in the last year that I haven't got to meet because of COVID. And it's kind of bummed me out because I used to spend a lot of time out there face-to-face -face with people 
but uh, I know I've kept in touch with a lot of the management foremen, supers, and they're doing the same thing. They're learning how they're learning how to manage. They're learning what it means to really care about people. And so you fast, we always cared about our people. Um, like I said, we were always the let's, let's give so many chances, but we're caring about, I, I guess it's more real now. Like what we actually care about is more real. It's more beneficial. It's, a, it's not, it's not kind of supporting somebody who's not really successful. Like we are actually creating a, a space for people to be successful. And I think it leads to what our passion is. We sat down with Will in the first meeting and <laughs> it's kind of funny. He says, you know, what's your passion? What do you, what do you get up out of bed to do every day? I'm like, well, we build substations. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Okay, I, I get you guys build substations, but I mean, what's the driving force behind it? What, what truly is it? And I'd say we spent about half an hour on the subject talking about it. And we, we came up with, we really want to see people succeed. And, and we want to see people push their limits of greatness. And so he says, well, how do you do that? And we landed on inspiring. And so our company's passion is to inspire people to push the limits of greatness. Just once you hit the peak, look out to the next one, see where it is. And, you know, we want to support you. We want you to constantly grow. We want you to be the best you can be. I think here's, here's a key indicator of success, Will. Four years ago, I didn't see a lot of our employees buying houses. I see a lot of our employees buying houses right now. There's people that are, there's just wild success happening and there's a lot of sharing and caring and uh, compassion. And for me, it's, I want to see people retire. I want to, I want to see people thriving in life. And I think you're seeing that four years later. Well, all right. So would you say that your people are performing now? Absolutely. We, <clears throat> So we do uh, quarterly conversations. You have your people analyzers. You're constantly trying to give feedback. And I mean, it, it's gotten out, it's gotten in front of us a little bit because you've got growth, you've got COVID constraints. We're, we're problem solving, trying to figure out how to get it done. And I even told a manager recently, like maybe you might want to consider just doing Zoom or go to meeting or whatnot, at least so we get the conversation going. Cause it's, it's just a lot of work at this point, but you keep the conversation going and, um, People have been enjoying it. You've seen it. We've seen a lot of success. We've seen a lot of people rising in the ranks. Um, we here's here's something really cool. Four years ago, we still had quite a few. I'd say, let's see, four years ago, we probably sat around 30, 40 employees. I'd say 15 of those were people that had been here for at least five years. And I would say out of those 15, 10 of them were probably stagnant. I would say they're stagnant in their growth. They were stagnant in their, in their capabilities. And so we, we created, like I said, the accountability chart. We created a training program. Uh, we created a management structure that supported that. We've given classes and we've, we've created a system that allows people to look for the support they need to get what they want, which is another concept I learned, right? Which is, what do you want out of this? Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a big thing too, is we're finding out what people want. Once a year, you ask, what do you see happening over the next year? What do you want to achieve? And we're actively trying to do that. And so for, for me, yes, people are starting to achieve what they want to achieve. I've seen people step up as foremen. People are stepping up as superintendents. We're seeing guys meet journeyman level. It's just, there's so much more active growth happening in the company. And a lot of that has to do with, with uh, the structure that we put in place here. What's about profit? Are you seeing more profit now? Well, I think what we're seeing is that we can actually gauge and predict profit a lot. We can forecast a lot more than we could before, a lot more effectively than we could before. And so, like I was telling you, it's a little bit of a weird topic because we used to take the scraps that had pretty high margins because we bid at high margins. And when there was nothing else, nobody else could take it, we got it. And so once we moved into the market, I would call the competitive market space where we actually had to compete. Uh, we did see a dip in, in profit, but we actively chose to lower profits 10%. That was the goal. We said, what if we lowered profit 10%? We'd still be sitting at a really healthy number. We're very happy about that. And we predicted that we could see at least, we thought uh, at that time we were sitting around six and a half million in revenue. We, in one year, we lowered our profit margin by 10%. 
and our revenue doubled mm. in a year. And so the cool thing is, is that in, in our, in our major growth, let's see, we had, we had one year where we had a really high margin, everything, we just, we just hit a lot of things right. It went our way. And then we had a really tough year. Um, in 2019, the fires hit, it shut down the Northern California market. It brought down resources from PG and E down into Edison, which flooded our market, which a couple of our competitors were kind of lowballing jobs. And we weren't willing to dip that low because you can't lose money on a project. And so that year we changed it, that. I think that year is the greatest indicator of success, because I will say this, if we did not have our act together in 2019, I think that we, I don't think we could have done what we did. I think that year we still hit, we hit 16 and a half million and it was the hardest year that we've ever had. And it was, our profit margin was cut in half though. So we kept our, we were able to keep our revenue up, but profits were cut in half. But the thing about it was, it wasn't a reactive thing. It was an active decision because we had the information and we knew what we were doing when we got into that space. So here's the, here's the cool thing It's okay. So revenue gets cut in half. Well, a year later, we go into 2020, which is last year, whole nother situation. And once again, we had a really robust structure. People knew what they were doing. We had almost 100% right people, right seat across the board. And we responded with our best year ever. Uh, we did about just shy of 24 million. We, we grew our revenue by about $8 million. And if we had not had our act together in 2019, there was no way we were positioned in 2020. And our profit margin, even though it was cut in half in 19, we were able to bring back half of that cut and we, we had grown a lot. And so for me, we're coming up short, just shy of our profit goals, but they're really aggressive profit goals. I will say this, when we talk to, when we talk to our financial group, our team that we have put together, they're really, really excited about what we're doing. And they feel really confident in us. Um, they feel good about our, our, um, our money, you know, what, what, we've, what we're able to revenue and where we're sitting from a cash standpoint. And I would say, I would say we're hitting the mark where we want to be. I mean, we're very lucrative, um, especially if you consider the fact that we're not all, we're not that less lucrative and we've grown our revenue almost six times. And we're talking single digit percentage points, maybe 5% less than what I think we could be, but we've gotten more complex and more robust. And so this year we've put a heavy emphasis on our uh, core value of efficiency, planning, bringing people together, training, and, and already we're seeing a massive shift. So I expect this year, I expect profit margins to, I think we can get back to where we were in 2018. I think it's a possibility. So what about, what about your time now? Uh, before you were saying that you were working a lot, 60, 70 hours a week. So where are you and your leadership team in terms of owning your business instead of your business owning you? Yeah. So I think, I think for me, I'm a dad. I have two daughters. Um, I have a really, I have an awesome wife. And I, when my first daughter was born, I said to myself, I do not want to be a bad dad. I was like, I just, I just can't be that. I, I, I want to be there for my kids. And so I said, uh, my work life is not conducive to that. So I need to figure that out. And I think for me, I still put in the heavy weeks here and there. I mean, it, there's issues that pop up and there's no way around that. But I'd say on average, I'm probably down anywhere from 40 to 50, maybe 55 hours a week. And I'm probably more sitting at 40 to 50. And I'm probably more efficient than I was when I was working 60, 70, to be quite honest with you, because mm -hmm. everything is everything is figured out. We know what we want to do. And I was having a discussion about this with one of my managers uh, earlier today, actually, is you become more competent. You understand things that you didn't understand before, and it makes things easier and it's less time consuming. And so does my business still own me? I think the business owns me a lot less than it did before, uh, especially because I can see 
where I'm putting my time now and I can see who's supposed to be doing what and I can see where I'm not letting go of the vine and where I need to have somebody come into place and, and take that responsibility from me. And I, I think it's still, I'm still in the process. I think it's more of a me thing than anything else. It's, it's a mindset. You know, I was trained by my family and my family works hard. It's, mm. I remember going to a job site with my grandpa and it's like, grandpa's working 80 plus hours a week, you know? So mm. I wasn't even meeting his standards. And so a lot of it is a mindset and I'm really starting to see it um, blossom. I think my, I think after EOS hit, my partner, Tony, took his first vacation in a decade. So that's a really cool indicator. Uh, we've been trying to move into taking more time for ourselves. I think one cool thing is last quarter, uh, no, excuse me, not last quarter, uh, Q4 of 2020, I took two periods of time off, which I'd never, ever done before. But we had a lot going on. It was stressed. I was, I was, I was running full capacity. And once I exceeded capacity, I started to realize it was really weighing on me. And so mm -hmm. I was able to take a couple uh, five day stints where I was able to clear my mind. And like I said, we finished 2020 with a bang. I mean, we did a very excellent job as a company and as a team. And so for me, yeah, uh, I, I think that my partner, Tony, he loves to work. So I'm, I think he's actively choosing to work the hours mm -hmm. he does. Mm -hmm. My partner, Anthony, uh, he's, He's about to start a family, so he's been bringing more balance into his life. I think he's in the he's in really good shape right now because he's been finding time to to surf and do his activities and focus on his pregnant wife. And um, Brandon, the other member of our leadership team, he's been finding a ton of balance with his daughter. And so we're moving in the right direction. Will I'll tell you good. that much. Good, good. So so talk about the process. What what was the process from where we started? You, you talked about that 90 minute meeting where we met and I showed you what it was going to look like. What's the process been like over the past three and a half, four years? I think it's been, uh, man, how do I say this? It's, um, it's like an economy of scales. Like you start, you start in the very beginning and you're trying to conceptualize these concepts that are coming to the table. Uh, even say right people, right seat. You bring that to a company like ours and where we were and you say, I don't want to do that. I can't fire a person. You know, I, I gotta, I gotta keep them on board. Like they've got a, they've got this, they've got that. I, and, and so you, you kind of got to learn some hard lessons, I think. And so you start in the beginning and you say, do I really want to buy into this? And so we start going into our off sites with Will. Um, you end up with your two days. So you, let's see, we met with you the 90 days. We've got our quarterly offsite with you. We do our annual planning, which is our two day offsite. And, I, here's the crazy part is all of a sudden you start seeing things objectively. So now you start saying, well, do I have, do I have the right people on the leadership team? And, you know, and people on the leadership team are saying, well, am I in the right seat? Should I be doing this? Uh, my partner, Tony, he stepped out of the operations manager seat because he felt like once it was defined, it ended up, it wasn't the right fit for him. So he wanted to move into a space that he was more suited for, which was, huge. I mean, that, that was a really big step for him, which brought in Brandon, which helped, helped us build. And so for me, what's the process been? It was tough in the beginning. I'm not going to lie. It was tough because you, you've got this whole mindset and this is, this is what you do. And now you've said, no, we're going to do something different. And so we had to constantly remind ourselves, I'd say the first year, uh, when you look at the process, the progress we're making year over year now, um, we're three and a half years in the first year was probably the most difficult it it took a lot of uh, commitment and it took a lot of just just being calm being patient just saying look it didn't it's not working but it's okay here's what you got to do and just just moving moving through with that and just getting clear like I said with accountability chart getting clear with your people uh, getting clear what you stand for what are your values mm -hmm. what are you passionate about what's your market what's your What's your big picture, your three-year target? Um, what are you going to do over the next year? And it's like all these things you got to learn. Well, now we're, <laughs> so now we're three and a half years ahead, right? And I move fast forward three and a half years. We just had an offsite. It's like, we go into the offsite meeting and Will says, okay, write down your issues. It's like, I just, I know what to do now. You know, and boom, here's 30 issues for you, Will. These are things that we're going to work on. And um, 
I see that that it, things are becoming progressively easier for people and it's starting to become the way that we do business. It's not some side tool that we're, oh, we're going to try to do this thing. Like this is what we do and who we are. And I would say the hardest part was getting, it was probably right people, right seat for us. It was truly being objective and saying, is this the right fit for the company to have this person here? And is it the right fit for that person to be at this company? And that's, that was something that we struggled with, but I think it's everybody, from my perspective now, it's, it's the way of life. It's the way we do things now. And uh, I expect that we, we're going to keep getting better. Like we've got trainings going on right now. The next step is we're going to go through all the EOS tools and we're going to start training the lower level managers and getting them to see how we see things. And we're seven weeks into the trainings and everybody is really stoked about it. And so we're just starting to see it just, it's like, it's blooming. It's like a flower, right? It's just starting to open up and it, I don't like I said, it's getting easier. It's easier and easier. Well, all right. So what, what would you say to other leadership members, other business owners uh, about EOS? What would you, what would you say to them? I would say, sit down and ask yourself, what do you want? What do you want to get out of your business? What do you want to get out of your life? You know, what are you going to want to get out of the relationships that you, that you're involved in every day, uh, whether they be personal, whether they be business related. And then I would say EOS can help you figure out what that is and how to get there. I, I think for me, I would want everybody to know that's a business owner that you you can get whatever you want out of your business. And as long as you can see it, you can get it. And it may not be exactly what you wanted, but you'll, find, you'll have the pathway. You'll have the pathway to get there. And I think having that clarity that EOS brings allows you to move forward in what you want. Uh, I see a lot of business owners that are stuck um, doing certain things in their company and they can't see beyond that. And EOS has really opened up our minds uh, with where and what we can do. And I... Like I said, I remember sitting there thinking, I just want to have 40 employees and I want to be, you know, kind of in, I want to have a, you know, some good processes in place, like maybe some good people. And it's like, we're here, 114 employees. It blew, it's blown my mind. Um, more successful than I ever thought we could ever be. And now I'm sitting here wondering, well, well dang, what, what could we be? You know, and I, and it just comes down to what, and that's what EOS does. It, it really helps bring to the forefront what you want. I, I mean, I, I had no idea what our passion was. We had no idea what our values were. We had no idea where we wanted to go. Uh, we had a general idea. I mean, I think every business owner wants to succeed. And I think EOS helps you find the correct pathway for how you want to do it. Because nobody's coming in. Will's not coming in saying, here's how you do your business. He's helping you organize your thoughts and how, how you want to do it and how to make it happen. And so for me, I would say if you want to get what you want out of things, EOS is a very good opportunity for you to bring some tools into your business that'll that'll create a pathway for you to be successful and achieve the goals that you want to you want to achieve. Great, great. That is wonderful talking to you. Now, uh, what when you think about the future, what do you see? Where are you going? When I think about the future, right now I'm very focused on. Uh, a concept called LMA, which is uh, lead manage accountability. And I really just want to focus on people truly on people in the organization, truly understanding that uh, creating effective leadership, creating effective management. And those, you know, I, the model is leadership plus management equals accountability. And so for me, I think we can only as grow, grow as big as our, as our people will allow us to grow. I think, uh, like I said, we could be 200 employees, but that is not the model because uh, we, we don't have enough effective leaders in the company to be that big. And I'm, I'm not willing to compromise that. And so for us, the big picture is, I think, I think we could be as, as big as we want to be. That's my personal opinion. Uh, we have a 10 year target of being a $50 million a year company. I honestly believe we could be a 200, 300, 400, $500 million company if we truly wanted that. And so we're going to try to hit our 10 year target first, and we're going to try to build a, build a system in this company that, that produces leaders, great managers, uh, people that are very happy in their lives, both uh, professionally and personally. 
and just as create a space that allows people to thrive. And I, I honestly think that when you when that truly hits kind of the vision of what I'm seeing, I think you're going to see the company expand beyond what I can even comprehend. <laughs> that, that, that's very inspiring. That's great. Great to hear that, James. I, am, I just congratulate you on your, your progress and your success and your, your continued enthusiasm for the future. That's Thank great. You. Well, that's just, you know, that's just what, what this conversation is all about every week. This is just another example of how businesses in California thrive. 